Welcome to the CEN Show, a platform where we learn from the world community. I am your host, Ross Key Moscati. Our panel here today is Brother Doctor, we got Brother Machinda, we have Professor Amin Rob, we got Brother Joe Hembrick, historian Joe Hembrick. And this is the Fantastic Six, and our guest for this evening is C.J.H. Moore. He is one of our team members, and he's also an author who had a great book, in my opinion, and uh, Brother C.J. Moore, just briefly tell us that book, the first book that we talked about when you came on Professor Ross's show and Brother Hendrick's show. Tell us the title of that book. Okay, first of all, I'd like to say, I'm in right, you're looking good, I see you. <laughs> you, you must you be look kind. Oh, oh, yeah, I see you. I don't see anybody else. Now, uh, the first book was... And it took me two and a half years to write it. Was Natural Born Gangster, The Legend of Chris Bell. And we did a number of shows on that one. And I would like to thank all the readership and all the fans and potential fans that tuned in and viewed that. I want to thank you right now. And I also want to thank the higher powers before we start, before we get on with this. Okay. Now. Okay. Uh, Okay, brother, brother, uh, brother C.J. Moore. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, just one second before you talk about yes, that Yes, I book. can. So I wanted you to tell us the the title of it because okay. if you go to our platform, Community Education Network, and also if you go to YouTube, Community Education Network, you will see that. We have over 3,000 views on YouTube, and I'm showing it right now. 3,000 views, okay. which is our highest amount of views that we receive out of any of our videos. If I take you back to videos and I go to popular, you see that we have 3,000 views for this one, which is, that was on Professor Armin Ra and Joe Hendricks show two years ago and then yes. if you go to the next highest viewers views that we received was the book again which was on my show you see the cn show well I, let me say our show and it's 583 so that that's about isn't that if i'm doing the math correctly isn't that about six times more than the second highest v, uh, viewers views so Yes, it was very, it's yeah, very impactful. And um, I wish that we would get that type of uh, viewership, I could say, for our other videos, because I think they're just as impactful and the, the, the content that we provide. But it's, it's fine. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. So, brother, CJ H. Moore. We're just we're just going through some. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Do do you uh now let me just say this. Oh goodness. Okay, I'm back. I'm, I'm having some uh internet issues, so bear with me. So let me just you... say this. What what's that, Professor Rock? No, no, no. I'll just say this. No. So <laughs> so if I disappear, you know, Professor Ra always takes over. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, okay. he, he led me through the jungle. Mm -hmm. on, so now, on, our show. on that first show, he led me through the jungle. So, so let's go. Okay, so now, um, the books. Let me just say that about about the uh, the first book. The first book was very descriptive, and it's almost when you're reading, it's almost like you being right there in the in the reading. And that's how <laughs> descriptive it was. And then I, I haven't had a chance. Let me. Show everybody the the new book that's just out, and I had it pulled up. So where is it? Oh, it was on the other computer. Okay. Well, just let me. I'll I'll share it in a little while. I'll share it in a little while. But but uh, I want to say a few things about both of the books and how they correlate to me. 
Okay. But I'm gonna go ahead and let Brother Moore, Brother Moore, go ahead and uh tell us the title of your new book and then what we're gonna talk about tonight. Thank you very much, uh Rigo. Uh my new book, uh, first of all, I'm gonna tell you it, took, it only took me eight months to write this book. I remember writing it and I wrote it six years ago. It just got published uh, this February. Now, this book, the title of it is Opportunity, the Largest Cash Heist in American History. It's about six brothers from the Compton Carson area who stole, or that stole, $18.9 million from the Dunbar facility over in, on Mateo Boulevard in the city of LA. Now, the reason I the reason why he was able to get a, away with this is because he was an employee for two years before he hatched out the plan to take the money. And he conscripted with five other people, his childhood friends, to go along with him and steal this money. And they got away with it two years. They, the FBI couldn't even get a lead. They didn't know anything. And they were in the dark for two years before an illumination happened. Now, they were upset because they couldn't uh, catch him or the perpetrators who pulled this off. But when they finally did it, they were like hungry wolves, found out, got this information, and this information came from an inside source. That's the only way that they could catch him. Other than that, they would have never caught him. And, and there's still $10 million that's floating around out there somewhere. Nobody knows where it is. Mm. Well, Brother Calvin. Yes. Let me say a few things. So sure. this book, I've, I've read probably about six chapters of it, and I have a little ways to go. But what I notice about the book, both of the books have childhood characters that was exceptional in their in their personality and their ability to do things at a very young age. Would you agree to that? Yes, I would totally agree to that. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, I tutored and taught school for eight years, for eight to Z tutoring. And I taught in the Indian Empire all over. And I love teaching kids. I taught 500 kids how to read And that really fulfilled me. So I like children. I like teaching children. Okay, so let me let me ask a few questions to get this started. And the first question is, what motivated you to write this book? Well, uh, a guy, now, I wrote Natural Born Gangster, The Legend of Chris Bell, inside of a Starbucks. And I probably told you that before. Two and a half years in the Starbucks, I woke, woke up every morning at 6 a.m. or before 6 a.m. and was at Starbucks at 6 a.m. Uh, and I wrote the entire book there. Uh, the second question I have for you, what is the objective of the book? Well, what's the your objective, objective? Of, this, of, of this book is to yes, tell sir. a true story. To tell a true story and to let you know that some guys from the Compton Carson area pulled off the robbery because they stole 18.9 million dollars. That is the largest cash heist in American history. That's a story that made history. So my job was to tell the truth. It's a true story. And I talked to one of the guys that pulled it off in order to do that. That's the objective of the book. Now, 
Do I know what the $10 million is that's still out there? No. I alluded to it in the book where it may be. But Alan Pace III is the only one who knows that, knows where the money is. Okay. So now, before I get to my next two questions, I'm going to go, Brother Doctor read the book. But Brother okay. Doctor, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and get a few questions in. Okay, yeah, well, stop me. <laughs> I'm going to get too many questions, man, because like I said, I love the book. And oh, you I, did? Well, I, thank I, you very much. I love the book. And like I said, I, you know, I saw yeah, you saw opportunity. And I'm going to read yeah. one of the little quotes. I will seek opportunity. If not given opportunity, I will create opportunity. I love that, man, what you got there. The okay, book, so man. now. now I love that. That. Was, that was my next question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, brother doctor, you just hit my next question. So go ahead, Calvin, talk to us about that, and and what is that, as far as as it relates to the book? That, okay. Uh, now we know that our culture is not the richest culture in America. Now, in order to make anything work or most things work in America, you need money. People make the world go around. But money, what it does is it causes businesses to fail or to succeed. It's the lifeblood of, of business is money. Blood goes through the human vein. Money goes through the business vein. You need money. And if you don't get money, you got to get a transfusion. And all that is is a loan from somebody. Okay. So money, the opportunity to get the money is what the whole thing is. Uh, now, what I'm really saying in that is that if you don't want to give me an opportunity, I'll make it happen. So he made it happen. He was there at the facility. He worked there as in security for two years. He saw an opportunity to go in there without being detected, and he took the money. But he needed help because he only stayed in there for 30 minutes or less. He went in there, bam, 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 bam. Thank you, ma'am. And he was gone. But there's a lot of things that I want you to get out of the book because on page 300, that's what really gets me. I wrote a soliloquy that I think would make you make you top the soliloquy from Hamlet. And that's Shakespeare. Now I love Shakespeare. Okay. Uh, I've written a lot of sonnets. I like his work, but I like his sonnets more than his uh than his plays. Okay, brother Calvin. Now, if you question, yes. what is a so, so, what do you mm -hmm. say a soliloquy? Soliloquy. That means when the character makes a speech to audience only and every character on stage does not know about it, does not hear it. So the soliloquy is telling you of the character's feelings, how he feels about stuff. And the soliloquy was all about opportunity. I had the opportunity to do this. You weren't going to give me the opportunity. So I took it upon myself to create the opportunity. And I took the money. And, and when he took the money, he was doing well. He started a business, he was doing everything he wanted to do with it. But somebody in the uh in in in, in the crowd, in the clan, so to speak, dropped a dime on him. Dropped a dime on him. Tony. Okay. Didn't Can you hear, hear that, me? Didn't hear that last part. Oh, they dropped a dime on him. Somebody from, uh, uh, okay, his own people, his own people, they told on him. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. 
Now, the book in the argument, there's a book, book in the argument. It's like a thesis in a uh, mission statement. It's a mission statement, a thesis in an essay. That's what the argument is. It tells you exactly what the writer is going to talk about all the way through the book. And my argument in, in, that, in that book, in this particular book, is this. You see, this is how the book looks. If you can see it. Okay, well, it's freezing. Opportunity, if you saw it. Now, it said, fate, friendships, and love make poor bedfellows in a world of wealth, laws, and justice. So, out of all that money that those guys got and got away with, somebody was untrue to them. It was untrue to them. And I would like for people to read the book to find out where the, where the problem was. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, as long as you can hear me. Now, now uh, a guy in the book, uh, one of the characters in the book had a girlfriend that they couldn't get along with, that he couldn't get along with. And she went out, Alan Pace III told them to lay low so he wouldn't draw any attention to himself. But this one lady, and you have to read the book to find out who it is, run lady wanted to be extravagant. She went out and bought a whole bunch of furniture and fixed up the house like it was a Taj Mahal in common. It was stuck out like a sore thumb. And Alan told his, his, his friend to simmer her down. He couldn't do it. So the way he simmered her down was he uh, uh, cut up all the stuff, all the stuff that she made look beautiful in her home, he took it out. All the furniture, all the figurines, all the pictures, and all, whatever she uh, bought with that money, he took it out. Now, they had a fight when this happened. And she actually threw a knife at him, but she didn't really want to, want to kill him. And, uh, and the knife missed him. So, but they had a child together. And she wanted her child to have a good life. And the Lloyds of London was put out a $250,000 reward for this. So she put it together. She went in and she turned them in. Now, the FBI story that you heard about it, that ain't how it happened. They, they said that the real estate, they had a real estate deal and, the, and they got the money wrappers. They didn't get it that way. I hear you, Calvin. Not able to hear you. Professor Rod, you can hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, he knocked something out again. <laughs> oh, he can't. Can you hear us, Calvin? Your sound is out. Can't hear you, man. Un unplug your, let me call him, man. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. you back. back. All right, go ahead. No, you yeah, didn't. you know what? Yeah. You went out again. No, it's okay now. All okay, right. you, you want to uh, let Brother Doctor ask you another question? Because I know probably Mashenda, Embrick, and Rob may have something for you. 
Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Now, I just want to uh, put a cap on, on, on that, what you asked me. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Uh, the Lloyds of London offered $250,000 reward. One of the girlfriends of the group that stole the money had a baby by the guy. Okay. And what she did was turn him in. Because she had some money wrappers to take to her brother, who was a real estate agent. And uh, she turned the money wrappers in. That's how they uh, caught her. She was unhappy with her life. She wanted to live a different life. And besides, in the book, she was a stripper. She worked at a strip club in L.A. Okay, I'm All done right. with that one. Brother Doctor, you have another question before we get to Rob? Machine yeah, Day. okay, yeah. I'm glad he cleared up that point because that was one of my questions. When I did my research, like you said, they said that, uh, I won't say Freddie, but the brother went in to the real estate dude with all the money still in the original Dunbar rapper. Right. And yeah, I saw that part with a stripper. Yeah, but yeah, he threatened her because he gave her the money go invest in real estate and she went and bought furniture and stuff. You and read he come the to the house and he like, wait a minute, where where's all this stuff in the house? This come from you plus went and bought money. He threatened to kill her. That's when she came back at him. But I think you even your own story, I think you missed the point. Rather your own story. I think it was the wife. Remember the other wife said, hey, none of those dudes ever been in prison. None ever been tested. That's how they got caught, because that the one brother, yeah, the one that couldn't hold his mug, man. They, they never been tested, because the story is going to be that the lawyers came up that, hey, we can just say she found a rapper on the ground. Right, right. I remember you wrote that, yeah. Shapiro. But uh, I, I, I think with, with the wife, the one wife, it was either Mark or Alan's wife said, hey, none of those dudes were tested. Remember, they made the pact. They made the pact that anybody could ever get caught. Just keep quiet and, you know, the family would be well paid off. But now, like I yeah. said, you, you know, she went and told. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you carried that part up. Because, like I said, I did my research and saw all the YouTube videos. They said he went in and tried to buy some real estate, gave it to the broker. And the broker knew that the money yeah. was missing. Told. But I want my last one, I want to say, hey, the teacup, the story about the teacup. At the oh, you like that one? Yeah, man. I okay, heard some, that somewhere. I can't. Where did you get that? Because I heard that before. And I can't remember. Okay, let me tell you where I got that. And this is true. There was a guy in the neighborhood, and he's a very uh, upstanding, righteous guy. My dad really liked this guy, and his name was Dan Danny Foster. He told me that teacup story. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. See, because my, my screen is doing a whole lot of jumbles around here. He told me the story about the teacup. And I looked on the internet, did my research, and they had it on there. But that was something that I had to put in to make the story interesting because the teacup is a good story. That's an African story. So I put it in there because Mark. What he did eventually was became a preacher. You know, his his grandma, Pearl, she took him to church all the time when he was young. So that's all he knew. He was really a religious guy, and he didn't want to steal that money. But he was friends with Alan Pace III, and Alan talked him into stealing the money. So and he didn't know anything about much. He didn't know about gambling. Henry knew how to play blackjack and took him to uh, Vegas. Henry taught him how to play blackjack. Mark was really an upstanding guy. He was honest, and that's the way uh, Grandma Pearl taught him. Okay, so let's let's get to uh, Brother Hembrick. Brother Hembrick, any questions or comments? I don't know anything about the book, so I can't answer. Oh, all right, Joe, Joe, let me say this. You already told me that you didn't get into high stories. Say what? You already told me that. You didn't get into high stories. 
In other words, you didn't really get it. I told you about the book. You say, man, I don't want to hear about that. But what's related to a high story? All right. Well, Mark, he was a religious guy. He religious, but he was religious with a black Jesus. That's in the book. Black Jesus. That's what he talked about. I don't care what color Jesus is. <laughs> 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 okay. See, I knew right. that would fire you up. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's, let's move on, Brother Michelle. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Brother Michelle. Where are you? Okay. Yeah, I think he. Well, let's go to Professor Ross. See if Brother Michelle get him later. All right, Professor Ross, you always come up with some good questions <laughs> that blow me out my seat. Now, <laughs> which one? Which one you uh, you gonna throw at me this time? Uh, first of all, appreciating your your presentation up to this point, and also oh, appreciating you. your uh, uh, just writing uh, historical characters and books, and and really portraying the black community in, in very uh, unique ways. I I just have a question: How did they steal the money? Okay, because, you know, I mean, you told me that he worked there, and he yes. got his, he got his crew together. Right, but eighteen million dollars is is heavy. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> That's why it took six people. Yeah, yeah. See, well, it's better. <laughs> he, he he only had five at first. He had five. See what they did was they went to a party because they wanted to stage an alibi. Right, they went to a party. They, they had planned all this. And uh, on the night of the party, he brought in the sixth person. And he was actually Hispanic. He wasn't black. Okay? Brought him in, and they went down, and they stole this money uh, in less than 30 minutes. And they came back to the party, and nobody ever knew that they were missing. Okay. Okay. Now, how he planned it? He, no, how he, how, it how, he, how he got in and got the money? He had keys. Oh. He knew where everything was. See, you okay. have to read the book. See, there was a, a woman employee that he was making love to. Okay. He got the keys from her. She was a key employee. And there was another employee that worked all of the uh, the surveillance and, and, and the cameras outside. He had one of them to turn the camera toward his car so they wouldn't see them coming up. And he had keys. The boss called him the night of the robbery and said, you fired. You got to turn your keys in. But the FBI story told it a different way. But he was fired. He said, boss, I can't come today. I have a party tonight. I planned this party for months. Can I turn them in Monday? And I said, okay, because he really liked Alan. But he was a prankster and a jokester. He joked with everybody. And he joked with uh, the people on his job to the point, but that's where he got fired because he put uh, something hot under one of his employees that was above him, and it burnt, it burnt him pretty bad, burnt his hands and burnt his body. That's why he got fired. Now this Mexican that they put in, did he know the Mexican and was he? Oh yeah, childhood friend, childhood okay. friend. Okay, he, he knew him, okay. and he knew he was down. In fact, some of those guys were partial gang members, the okay, Bloods but, and the Crips. Yeah, but two quick questions. Yeah, they didn't give them give him a lie detector test. Who, Alan? Yeah. Okay, then that's a very good question was smart. See, you don't know how smart he was. <laughs> you know what he did? What? Uh, he passed it. They gave him all one. Mm -hmm. But he schooled them all. He, mm -hmm. he, uh, 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 you know what he did? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. You can come up with some good questions, Donald Ron. He put a tag on his toe. He put a tag? He passed the lie detector. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Now the other question is, it was six yeah. of them? You say it was six of them? Six. Yes, it was six. All right. So 18 million, they divided. 900. Huh? Thousand. 18 no. million, 900,000. 900,000 is close to a million. It's really, in the book, they really stole more than that. That's what was reported. Mm -hmm. Now, the guy you talked Mark, to. Mark figured out. Uh huh. The guy you talked to. The guy. I mean, wh uh -huh. why did they leave the money still in wraps? Was it so much they could, they just took out what they wanted and left the rent? Now, that's mm -hmm. another good question. Yeah. Now, Allen told them they weren't supposed to take that money in the first place. But Henry took it anyway. If you read the book, he said, F what he want to do. Mark said, you're not supposed to take that money. I'm taking this money. He wasn't supposed to take it. It was another set of he money. He told him to leave it alone. I beg your pardon? So, okay. The money they took. Mm-hmm. Didn't have wrappers. Is that what you're saying? No, it had wrappers. No, it had wrappers, but it didn't have the wrappers that he knew that could be traced. Okay. Okay. See, now, Allen knew all that. Yeah. And, 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 and when they went in there to take the money, uh, one of the uh, members started putting the money on 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 the cart, and, and uh, Allen said, "No, not those." Mm. But they didn't listen to him. They didn't follow instructions. They put it on there anyway. Then later on, he found out that the rappers, that money was in there, and he told them to burn it. Mm. So they burnt it. Mm. And then uh, another guy came up with a, with a way to get rid of the money, and that's going to Vegas. Mm. So they went to Vegas and started playing the games, the blackjack and all that, those gambling games. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they were trying to launder it through Vegas. Mm -hmm. so, but Henry, I believe it was Henry in the book, did not get rid of all that money. He kept it hidden in his house without Alan's knowledge. And then Priscilla, his girlfriend, found out about it when they wanted to do this real estate deal. That's how the rappers got there. Okay, but when they went to court, uh, would they make a deal? Yes. They made a deal, or did they uh, uh, go all the way? Okay, to that's very good. Five? No, they turned states evident on that one because they scared the, the mess out of them. They say, we're going to do this. Well, you know how the police do. We're yeah. going to do this and do that yeah. to you if you don't do this. Yeah. So they turned on him. Everybody mm. turned on him but Mark. Mm. Okay. They were childhood friends. Everybody turned on him, man. They say, yeah, he did it. But how his defense was that I screwed all their women and they're just jealous. Mm. <laughs> well, Go, That's go. his defense. The only defense he had. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 I'm gonna go back to what the doc asked you. Okay. Uh, tell the story of the teacup. What I mean, you said it's an African okay. story. What is? Yes, it's an African story. Okay. Now, what happened is the teacup was clay. It was made out of clay. It had to be molded and it had to be heated and it had to be painted. Mm -hmm. And they put this teacup on, on when they finished with it, when the guy who, who made it finished with it, uh, he put it on the top shelf mm -hmm. so, it, so it could be seen. But it had to go through all that pain and all that heat, and it mm -hmm. wanted to die and everything else. Mm. Uh, before it got to, to 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 be placed on top of the shelf, mm. makes sense. Yeah. Uh huh. Makes sense, Amara. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. I, I'm I'm good, Rashiki. All right, brother doctor. Any more questions?
I was gonna say, yeah, Rasky, you can find a teacup story and post it real quick. But uh, yes, yeah, I got, I got, yeah, man, you just told the whole book. <laughs> well, you I wrote the whole it. Book. You know, yeah, you know, it was other parts ride. They uh, you know, they went to the U-Haul truck, backed it up, broke out the tail light, so they had the tail light. They finally found it was U-Haul truck. That's right. This now, now let me go to the little issues I had. Just sure. one of the, we, we, we you wrote, you you start describing all the men as handsome, and it got to the point where I had to go back. Wait a minute, man! I'm reading. Is this the same guy? I had to keep going back because you were describing everybody as handsome. So I was thinking mm-hmm. I was reading about the same guy, but I had to go back, read, go back a few times, and you were describing different people. But you just That's used right. that one handsome for like four or five men, and it just got That's me right. confused because I had to go back and see if I was reading about the same guy. That's the only kind of little thing, but the beginning when you talked about the marbles, man, that touch home, man, because that's yeah. what we did—the circles, the mounds, uh, yeah. the cartoons. We all played marbles. Mm-hmm. The only thing, the only thing we didn't do in Compton, man, we we didn't have the cap guns. We had the BB guns, and we didn't play yeah, cowboys you- and Indians. We played cops and robbers. <laughs> the other stuff was so close, man. It just it, it touched me there, man. Okay, now where I grew up in Compton, over in the hole, if you know where it is, on the southwest side of Compton by a big uh, open field. Right now they have the uh, Compton uh, Development Center over there. They have all these buildings that are empty now. But we used to play in that field and we played with cap guns and we played Army uh, as well, Cowboys and Indians. I played it as a kid. Now, where this happened, where these guys lived was only a few miles from where I grew up. That's why I, I told my producer who asked me to write the book that I was born to write this book because I knew the area and I knew the culture of the people back in the 60s. And on and on up. But thank yeah, you talked about reason. the the Knicks, the Knicks cashing place, the Santa Claus coming in yes. at the beginning. That's uh, not even there anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you you mentioned about because I like I said we I think we all grew up in Compton and like I said I knew the areas over there, man. You were talking about it by a practice. Even when you talked about one of the jurors that went to Compton High, the Mexican guy that was a tar babe, you know, you put that in the book. Uh yeah. let me ask you, is it something? Did I you miss did something? Read it. Yeah, did I, did I mean, miss like, something because Remember right. when when you got the six guys, they all were gonna go by numbers. Yeah, I saw you do the jurors by numbers. Right. Is this some secret something code in there that I missed? Because I'm always missing no. codes. Is it some yeah, kind of yeah. special code you put in See, the book? I miss writers, writers put codes in there. Right. That work. All something I, I know I missed something. What? See, you need a theme in order to develop a motif. Now, I wanted you to get that. They both had numbers, but where did they get them from? Mark brought that up when right. they had a meeting. We should right, go right. by number, right? He brought it up because he said he got it from a movie. Oh, yeah, now, yeah. Now, in a jury, they go by numbers, and you know that's legal. They do that. So going by numbers, what we have is irony there. We have irony, and that's what you're missing. One is for the the good, and one's for the bad. You have a set of numbers that want to take the other numbers down. So we have the irony. And that's hard to find. That That's hard to figure out. But I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad you felt it. That's what I want you to feel when you read the book. The tension. Uh, when you really read something, you can get more out of it. That's what's really in a book. And when an author writes a book, don't you know he has a follow art? He has a follow art. He's getting something out of it too. Or she. Right, right. You know, like I said, man, it was a great book. It was so great, man. I forgot to take my notes. Because I just, man, it was a good read, easy read. I, and I usually, yeah. when I read books, I, you know, I take notes. But I went through it. Like, oh, man, I forgot. To, I want to, you know, I had to go back and try. I want to actually, I forgot to take my notes. But like I said, most of it was so, you know, I grew up the same thing, man. Same stuff. 
I know. Neighborhood, I know. you got the uncle. But then let me ask you this. Yeah. It seemed like the security guard company was in one part, it was looked like it was doing well, but at the end they said it wasn't making money. I'm confused on that part. Okay. They uh that security company, uh, the name of it uh eludes me right now, but that was Alan Pace's stepping stone to get with Dunbar because they all started in, in security. They, they were friends and they all worked together. You remember when they worked at the KC? Kentucky Fried Chicken? Yeah. Over yeah, there, they were, uh, they, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, they named, there, I think uh, they did the initials for the, but they, they had, you know, they had rappers and, you know, movie stars. They were guarding and, I, I thought yeah. the company's doing well, but then at the end, somebody said the company was failing. And I don't know if that was the FBI or someone said that, but it kind of like, wait a minute. I thought, look, they could have been making the millions by the big company they were doing. They were doing great with the security company. They were making money. They were making a lot of money. That was Allen's plan from the beginning. We need money in order to make money. But the FBI knew that $18.9 million was stolen and they wanted to catch the culprits. That's all. That's all that was. An opportunity. It was an opportunity to do all these things. That's why the book is named Opportunity, the largest cash ice in American history. But the FBI told the story that was the way they wanted to tell it. And, and it wasn't true. So, I just give you the true story. So so now, Brother Doctor. Brother Doctor. Yeah. He's going to come back on next week. Oh, and, hey. and that'll give you an opportunity to dig for some more questions because I'm going to read and I'm going to get some more questions for him. And, uh, and, and because it's going so well right now, I'm going to have, we're going to have to take our pause because, you know, of our internet issues. So, Brother Calvin, I, 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 Appreciate you coming on, and I want to continue this part two next Wednesday. Hey, and, uh, and we gonna uh, come, come Rigo, some... Thank you, thank you for being a gracious host. And I want to say this, I'm in rock. Thank yeah. you, <laughs> thank for you, being bro. here and asking those dang good questions. You must be kind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, well, yeah, hey, I'm ready to go. I'll be back next week, and you can ask any question about the book. See, yeah. I wrote that book six years ago. Now, I'm going to tell you, I had to read it about 15 times in order to edit it. Uh, I'm talking about every word. Uh, That's what, what authors do. They read their own stuff. Now, I don't <laughs> like watching my stuff. <laughs> I don't like reading my own stuff, but I have to. I don't even like watching me on TV or this video. I have to. <laughs> I just want to keep on uh, doing my work. That's all I want to do. Okay? You're, doing, you're doing a great job, brother. Keep on telling these stories. You know. Okay. Really good. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Amara. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you a tidbit of information right now. Because you deserve to hear this. You remember uh, Suge Knight? Of and uh, that dude named Tracy that he killed, yeah. I wrote a hell of a book on that. Yeah, of that uh, um, thing. Yeah, that oh. happened right across the street from where I wrote Not the Gangster. I oh. got a whole scoop on it. Yeah. In fact, I met the dude. He came over to uh, uh, Starbucks and told me the whole story. I said, oh. wow, this is a book. So I wrote it. Uh. 91,000 words. Wow. Okay. Now, now that's that true. Just, Not that, what they. But, yeah, that that yeah. just happened. Maybe about what, three or four years ago? I know. I know it just happened. I wrote the book already. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. But it hadn't been published. That's how okay. I know it. See, that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that interests me. Uh, now, now, J R J K Rowling. And J.R.R. Tolkien, they write about what spurs them on. Harry Potter and the Lord of the Rings. Okay? 
and, and there's there's some good writers, but I write about what spurred me on, and that's where I grew up in my culture. And I try to tell the truth, not what they say it is. Talking heads to tell you anything. They don't come down here. They don't live here. I lived here. I know the truth, so I'm gonna tell it. That's a good thing. Man. Stories or any way I can. Yeah, that's reasonable. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Looking forward to reading more of the book and having some more questions for okay. you. Now, Professor Rob, okay, can thank you tell you. us about okay. Monday again? Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I, I was going to do a male female relationship, but I'm gonna come back with the history of the black struggle at Cal State Long Beach. I'm gonna send you some stuff that you can be posting while I talk. So okay, I, because I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, we had we had discussed you doing that, mm -hmm. and I thought we were gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, but we, uh, I'm glad you you changed it back to that because I want to yeah. hear about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a rich story. That's one of the black consciousness. Uh, I mean, they were one of the strongest black uni uh, Cal State University. I mean, others were good. Northridge, at that time, it was uh, San Fernando or something, San, San, something else. And then uh, Cal State LA, uh, those Cal State system colleges were very strong with BSUs and things of nature, but Long Beach was the strongest. And I, I want to go through the history of the BSU and the Black Studies program. That's so they, be... they're, sti they're still there, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the organizations on the streets are gone, but because it's a university and because they had a legacy and a culture for people to follow, uh, that was already there in the history. Uh, you know, those that got involved with that, uh, those programs uh, kept it going. And Dr. Kerang is over there now. But I'm, I'm just going to go from where I was there up to 2004. Okay. You know, because That's they changed be... the name in 2007, uh, 2007 or 2006 to Africana Studies. It took the blackness out of it. So we're going, I'm going to go over that, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm just going to talk about the personalities and the individuals that created the black movement at Cal State Long Beach. That's going to be a, a real good one. Looking yeah. forward to that. All right. All right, folks. Uh, thanks for that. Thanks a lot for attending and looking forward to next week, Brother Calvin. And yeah, okay. Calvin, we'll be here next week. Go ahead, go ahead. Like I always do. Intelligence ends where spirituality begins. <laughs> okay. And we want to talk about that Intelligence too. Intelligence ends where spirituality begins. Go ahead. We're gonna, we want to talk about that. Okay. Part too. We can. All right. Don't forget now. All right. Each one, teach one in Conscious Corner. Everybody have a good evening. Right. The third was intelligent.